Amen. How's everybody doing today? You doing all right? Everybody enjoying the weather? It's been kind of cool, you know, kind of good, all right, maybe. Anybody getting your yard work done? I've gotten mine straightened out a little bit, you know, but uh, it's been good. Kind of crazy around here. You see in the news, we've had coyotes in the area, and, uh, and uh, it's been a little bit crazy in that sense. And uh, we talked about that a couple of weeks ago, you know, about, um, about the coyotes. But, you know, pray that everything is stay safe and the neighborhood is able to um, you know, things are something something's able to be done about that, but so it's been a good week um, for 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 us, and uh, I know many in our in our body here, our family have been sick and dealing with sickness, so we just continue to pray for those who are are struggling in that area. But it's a good day, isn't it? Amen, amen, amen. Well, this is week three, and we're uh, we're continuing our series. Next week is Mother's Day. You're going to be honoring your mom next week. It's going to be an awesome time. We've got free portraits in the back for our mom. So moms, bring your families. Bring your families. We're going to take portraits, and you're going to get free prints, and uh, it's going to be a great, great day. And if uh, your mom doesn't come to church here at Church 180, bring her along, and uh, we want to bless her too and honor our moms and uh, just be a blessing to them because they do so much for us, don't they? Really, and they've, um, and you know, my mom made a forever made an impression on my life. She's no longer with us right now, but she's with the Lord right now. But she forever made an impression on my life, and I thank God for for her and the life that that she lived. And uh, I wouldn't be who I am today if it weren't for my mom. My mom prayed for me. My mom had patience with me, even though I was going the opposite way she was going. She stayed faithful and um, to God and on her knees praying for her son. And, uh, I, man, I thank God for that, you know. Amen, amen. But it's week three, and uh, we're talking about, um, the Bible doesn't say that. And some, some, we're talking about some misconceptions of not only in the Bible, maybe culturally what, the, what, what people have in, in, in culture about what the Bible says or about life in general. And we're, we're continuing this week as with um, the, the, the concept, anyway, of as long as it doesn't hurt anyone else. But the Bible doesn't say that. It's all right to do what I want to do as long as it doesn't hurt anyone else. Last week, some of you noticed I got a new Bible. See, my, I love my new Bible. <laughs> you know, I, uh, I showed you a couple weeks ago my, the first Bible that I got. Actually, I got it when um, my parents dedicated me to the Lord, a little pocket Bible. It got all worn out, but I still, I still, I still break it out once in a while, you know what I mean? And uh, it's worn out, and it's, it's, uh, but I, I use it, and it, it meant so much to me when I got, got saved. And uh, in fact, I've still got the, 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 the Bibles that I got after I came to the Lord. I had this NIV study student Bible that it was a paperback edition that I, that I still have, and it meant so much to me um, during that time when I was just growing in the Lord and hungry for His Word. And, uh, you know, it was kind of cool because I, it, would, it would explain Scripture to me as I was learning. And uh, then I had this other Bible similar to this one that, I mean, I wore that thing out, the, the, and I still have it. It sits on my desk every day, and I, I still read it because for some reason it seems like God speaks to me better through it. I don't know, but, but man, the, the pages are falling out, and it's all tattered, and it's just a mess, but I love it, and I read it, and, it, and it's just I just love reading God's Word through it. It's kind of like my blankie. My, my daughters have these, either, they either have their, their stuffed animal, or they have their, they have their, their, their blanket, you know, and, uh, but that's mine, and it, it means so much to me, and I, I love it, and I can't, I can't even stand the thought of throwing it out, even though I probably should, but, um, but, you know, God's good. You know, I believe that's so important for us. Man, when I, when I got saved, I had such a hunger of, of God, with, for God's Word and getting into His Word and finding out what the Bible really says, and I think that's so important for all of us. I don't think anybody should come here to church and just, just be, necessarily just, just believe, blindly believe what your pastor is saying. I think you should go into the Word and discover God's truth for yourself. It's an amazing thing because hundreds of years ago, the press was invented and this thing was multiplied and multiplied and printed so that you can have it in your own hands. And it's important for us to know what the Bible really says and to, to find out for yourself because sometimes we hear things that aren't in the Bible and people assume that they are because they have not found out the truth for themselves. So a lot of assumptions, and there are a lot of assumptions and a lot of opinions in our culture in the world today because we don't really know what the Bible says. I encourage you, if you're not right now, take time every single day to get into the Word of God for yourself. Take five minutes a day even. Just five minutes. 
and read God's word and you can discover what the Bible really says and be able to, to, to decipher between what the Bible doesn't say and what the Bible really does say. We've been talking about some of that kind of stuff over these past few weeks. You know, there's this saying that says a, a Bible that's falling apart is a sign of a life that's not. It's all right if your Bible's a little beat up. It's all, it's all right if your Bible's pages are falling out. So it's all right if you come to church and your, your Bible has coffee stains on them, maybe, maybe a little pizza sauce over in the corner, I don't know. But, but it's important because it, you know what that tells us? It, tells, it, it shows that, man, this, this thing's with you all the time, and you're really serious about getting into God's, God's Word. Amen? Amen. Another, another tool for you, I think we have information on the back of the, not sure if it's there this week, but in the back of the bulletin um, about um, the Bible app. It's something, another tool that you can use. Um, I use it every day. It's, uh, um, it's, a, it's an app that you can get on your phone, and it's got many different translations that can suit you. It's got a lot of different reading plans and devotionals, and it's a, it's a way, an easy way for you to get into God's Word. Oftentimes when I'm sitting around, maybe I'm waiting for an appointment, someone to show up, or to to, uh, or I'm um, getting my oil change or whatever, and I have a few moments, I can break that out, and I can read scripture, get caught up in my plan, and I encourage you to do that. Get God's word in your mind. Get it in your heart. It will change your life. I remember a few years back, I was talking to a guy, and I, I, I built this relationship with this young man, and you know, this, this guy, he was not a believer. He didn't really have too many good things to say about the church or about God necessarily, you know. And, uh, and you know, at first it was kind of a, a struggle to build a relationship with this guy. But, I, man, I knew that he needed Jesus. And I knew that, that man, that, that God had set him in my life for a particular reason. And, I man, I prayed for this guy, Todd. I prayed and prayed and prayed for him. And I, I did my best to build a relationship with this guy. And I'd see him um, day after day and we, or week after week. And we and we'd talk, we'd have conversation. And he'd, he questioned me about my faith. He questioned me about the things of God and things in the Bible. And, man, he thought it was all fairy tales and all that stuff. I say, hey, did you ever read the Bible for yourself? I like, no. I've heard stories, though. I said, well, you know, I just challenge you to, to, to crack open the Bible and read it for yourself. But questions kept on coming, and he, was, he got, began to become more and more curious about the things of God and about the Bible. And we developed a pretty good relationship. We, we became friends, but there's a little bit of a tension there because he thought I was a crazy lunatic because I, you know what I mean? And, uh, but, but we became friends and we were able to have a relationship. You know, if we want to win people to Christ, we've got to build a relationship with them. Sometimes it takes time, okay? You know, it, it, it takes time to build relationships. Sometimes it takes time to, to win people to the Lord. And, and sometimes it means making friends with people who you normally won't be make friends with. Sometimes it, it takes praying to God and asking him to bring people in your life that you maybe never met before. May, may, may lead you into uncomfortable situations, and, but man, it puts you in a place where you trust God. But me and Todd, we began to become buddies, and uh, we began to talk about God's word, and, uh, and uh, he thought I was a crazy lunatic. And, but, uh, but you know, I, I, um, I explained to him the way of salvation. I explained to him, man, how to get saved and all that stuff. And, and, and one day he did get saved, and it was a radical. It was nothing short of miraculous what happened in Todd's life. He, he changed. God, God came into his heart and his life, and he was like a, a different person when he experienced Christ for himself. I don't know if you've ever experienced that, have you seen that, or, or you've had Christ change you in your heart. Yeah, I have. Some of us, it's more dramatic than others, just because you didn't have lightning bolts and thunderbolts crashing all around us, and angels blowing trumpets doesn't mean that nothing happened inside of us. It's an act of faith, and we believe in God's word and what God said, and we trust it, and we have this, 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 this confirmation inside of us that, that we're saved, but, we, but doubt creeps in, and we question it sometimes. It's just the devil trying to, to rob what the devil put in, what, what God put inside of us. But Todd was passionate about what Scott had done in his life. He, 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 he went home and he prayed and received Christ. And I, I saw him the next day and he said, hey, you know, um, something happened to me. <laughs> and I said, well, you know, you got saved. The Bible calls it being born again, you know. And he experienced something miraculous in his life. And it was more of a dramatic thing than I had ever experienced or what I've ever seen anybody else um, he was delivered from drugs just basically overnight, <laughs> you know, delivered from just a whole bunch of stuff. He was going through so much, and I, I, my heart broke for him 
for where he was in his life. He was going through a divorce, and he was, um, just had so much anger and, and resent and a whole bunch of stuff going on inside of him, but God sent me to, to, to minister to him. But Todd had never read the Bible. Todd had never maybe even held a Bible in his hands before. He didn't even know necessarily what it said, except for maybe some storybooks that he, maybe his mom read him when he was younger about Noah's Ark or something like that. But, but it was a foreign thing to him. And I said, you know what, Todd, I need, to, I need to get you a Bible. So he went to the store, and I bought him a Bible. And he went home. I saw him again. He said, man, I went home that day, and I opened that Bible, and I could not stop reading. <laughs> I couldn't stop reading. I just, I just couldn't get enough of it. And you know what? When I read those red, those, those red words, <laughs> my, my heart, it just started to pump and, and, and just flutter. like it. it was just so amazing. I said, because those are the words of Jesus. And he was amazed, and I was amazed by the, the hunger that, this, that this, 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 this young man had inside of us. May we never lose our hunger for the word of God. May we never lose our hunger for the things of God. Amen? Amen. Amen. But it's so important for us to get into God's Word and to really make it a part of our life and who we are. Let it transform the way that we think. The Bible even tells us to do that, to, to, to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Second Timothy 3, 16 through 17 says this, that all scriptures inspired by God is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. Sometimes we don't know that stuff's going wrong in our life, you know, and we're, we don't really know until we, the, the Word of God illuminates it to us and the Holy Spirit speaks to us through His Word and He brings conviction and we're able to make the changes and we want to follow Him. And God uses it to prepare and equip His people to do every good work. <laughs> you know, one of the most, I think one of you would say one of the most unpardonable sins in our culture is to actually... Um, deal with the, the subject of sin. Even in church, it's not that, that popular. You know, we want to hear all the fun stuff and the good stuff and how, how God's going to bless my life and how I'm, I'm going to be so happy and blessed. <laughs> but it's almost an unpartable sin to, in our culture to talk about or nevertheless never even, even say that something is a sin that somebody else is doing. And it, see, it, we have this, this concept in, our, in the culture that we live in that is, as long as what I do doesn't hurt anybody, it's all right. I mean, if I were to ask you, some of you who have read the Bible and are familiar with Scripture in the day of Jesus, I would ask, you know, ask you this question. What do you think, and I'll give you my answer pretty soon, what the greatest cultural value in the day of Jesus was? What do you think they valued the most? This is just my opinion, and I can't really necessarily prove it, but from what I see in Scripture, I could probably give you a strong argument that it was justice. They valued justice. You know, if you, if you, during that time, if you committed adultery, they'd stone you. If um, you were a heretic, they'd crucify you, you know, and, uh, and on and on, you know, and uh, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. We read about that in the, the Old Testament. But if you were to think about our culture today, what would you think and what would you say what our, our greatest cultural value is today, what would you say? What is our greatest cultural value? I'd say it's tolerance in our culture. In America today, it's tolerance. You hear a lot about tolerance. It's interesting, over the past decade or so, the definition of tolerance has changed. It used to mean this in, in, most, in most, most circles. It used to mean that, we, that, that all people have equal value. It doesn't matter what you believe. It doesn't matter what, what's going on in your life, but we value you equally. And we should. We should love everybody no matter where they are in life. 
Love is a value that we should all have, and, and tolerance in that way is a, is, a, is a value that we should all have as followers of Jesus Christ. We're going to value people. We're going to be kind to one another, even if we don't agree, right? We're going to be kind to people. We're going to love with the love of Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter if we agree with one another. It doesn't matter if we think differently on different pers- perspectives and maybe someone's living a way that we don't agree with. That we, will, we will value the person because they too are created in the image of God, right? But it's interesting over the past decade or so that the definition of tolerance has changed. And it used to mean, used to mean that people are of equal value. But today, tolerance has kind of involved to mean that all ideas and all behavior are of, are of equal value. It's changed. See, this is the thing that we've got to be careful about what we believe. Because we can't base our truth on what we believe. We've got to, be- we've got to base what we believe on truth. Because we can create our own truth if we want, but then it's not really not truth. Truth is something that does not change. Truth is something that we find within the Word of God. This is what we base our life on. This is what we base our beliefs on. It's Scripture. It's the God-inspired Word of God, and it does not change. Let's get an amen anywhere here today. Okay. (laughs) The Bible. Yeah. We're not reading magazines, and we're not, we're, not, we're not reading newspapers to try to get how to live, live our life. We're reading the God-inspired Word of God. This only has the power to change lives. And it was amazing what Todd, as I saw him get into God's Word, how, how, how the Holy Spirit just invaded his life. He, he became hungry to hear God's Word, and he, be, and, and he began to, to see areas in his life that needed changing. It began to correct him. It began, to, it began to, to, to convict him of sin, and he's able to make those changes in his life. Because you know what? You don't know unless you know. (laughs) You don't know until you hear. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, Scripture says. So he's able to make these changes in his life and able to let the, the word of God change him because he got into the word, got into Scripture. Romans 12, 2 says this, Don't copy the behavior and the customs of this world. But let God transform you into a new person by changing the way that you think. This is a New Living Translation, if you're wondering. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. So culturally, we've watered down morality and culture today. Even the terms that are associated with them, to give it more of a palatable taste to us, to make them sound a little bit better, we give them more acceptable phrases. You know, and things like when it comes to sexual sin, we'll say things like, you know, when it comes to, we won't call it pornography, we'll call it adult entertainment. <laughs> we, won't, we won't say that, that, that that's, that's adultery, we'll say they, they're having an affair. We won't say they're, 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 they're having premarital sex, we'll say, well, they're just fooling around. <laughs> we give them more palatable taste, palatable phrases to where we can accept it a little bit, a little bit better. Because in our culture, it's almost the imparable sin if we think something is sin. After all, my truth isn't the same as your truth. And, 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 and after all, doesn't God just want me happy? <laughs> we talked about week one. If you haven't heard the message, it's a good message. And God really spoke to a lot of people. He does. He wants you happy. He wants you blessed. But not at the expense of doing something silly, ridiculous, or sinful. He wants us happy. He wants us to to, to walk in wisdom and in his ways. 2 Timothy 4, 3 says this in the New Living Translation, For a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires, and they will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. (laughs) They're looking for pastors and teachers and, 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 and evangelists that are going to say what they want them to hear. And they're, they're gonna, the, the, someone who's going to say something that makes them feel good and, 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 and is accepting of where they are and what, in, the, in the sin in their life. 
With, and they never have to be confronted with the truth. See, sin is real and it has eternal consequences. And as a, and, and, you know, and, and it, it, it's a, a very real subject and something very important to really think about. And we can't just skirt around it in our teaching. We'll talk about some cultural misbeliefs about sin. We're not always this heavy, okay? If you're new here, you know, you know, it's a, you know we're going to have a great time the next uh, few weeks after Mother's Day. We're going to be talking about family. And it's going to be a great time and get into God's design for family and how we can become, have stronger families um, as believers and how, um, and just have a healthy, healthy, healthy home. So it's going to be a great, great time. And I believe that God has so much to speak to us today through his word. You know, some, some cultural misbeliefs about sin. One of them is this, that I'm not, not a bad person. First John 1 John 1.8 says, if we claim that we, that we are without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. You know, if we compare ourselves to other people without Christ, us without Christ, and them without Christ, we compare ourselves to other people, we're doing all right. We're not that bad. But if we compare ourselves to the holiness and the goodness of God, we see our need for a savior. This evangelist Ray Comfort years ago, he, he taught this course called The Way of the Master, an, an evangelism course, and, and he used the Ten Commandments to, to really show people the, the, their need for salvation and for Christ. He, he'd, asked his, he'd asked the people on the street, hey, have you ever, you ever told a lie? <laughs> Anybody here told a lie? <laughs> I have, I'm <laughs> sorry. Um, anybody stolen anything ever? First time I stole something, my mom took me right back to the store and made me talk to the manager. <laughs> Anybody ever, you probably won't want to raise your hand on this one, but <laughs> committed adultery, thought anything lustful in your mind, because the Bible says that if you even think about that, it's you're guilty of committing adultery. The Bible says if you hate your brother, that you're guilty of murder. Yeah. You know, and by, but if we think about it that way and we compare ourselves, because the Bible tells us that there, there's not one person except for Jesus Christ that has kept all the Ten Commandments. We're all in need of a Savior. And, 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 and by our own definition that we, we, we've sinned, and the Bible says we, if we've broken one commandment, we've broken them all and we're guilty. And we need him. Romans 3.10 says, there is, without Jesus there is no one righteous, no, not one. You know, this is the thing is that we have more grace for ourselves than we do for other people, right? Isn't that right? You get in the car and then you, you pull out in front, in front of somebody and you've got all this grace for yourself. Well, that was an accident. I mean, they're, they're just, you know, they're, they're, they're just, you know, going overboard there. But, but when they do the same thing to you, you're like, what is wrong with these people? Where did they even learn how to drive? Right? Right? We've got so much more grace for ourselves than other people. But until we recognize our sin, we'll never recognize our need for a Savior. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. You know, why is it that driving can bring out the worst in people? Have you ever noticed that one? It can, just, man, it, it can just bring the worst. It just seems like the day could be going so great and things are going good, but you get somebody behind a wheel... And it's just a totally different story. They turn into a, a different animal, it seems like. They could be the, the sweetest and kindest person, and then you stick them behind a wheel in rush hour traffic, and it's like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. They're like, ah, you know, going through, going through traffic. Or you get them behind, you, you're on your way to church, right? And you get behind a Sunday driver. It's like, not, it's like 9.59, and they're, and they're going like 20 miles an hour in a 45-mile-an-hour zone. And you're like, what is going on? Yeah, anybody? <laughs> but isn't it interesting, too, that you could have a great week with your, with your spouse, and it's just awesome. And you're just like, man, this is like the best week of our marriage, and it's awesome. But then you get in the car to go to church, and it just breaks loose. And you're like, man, this is like the worst fight we've had in years. <laughs> no one's raising their hand there, because they're like, oh, man, this morning was rough, right? 
For me, stick me in a car and I'm running five minutes late, you'll see me stressed, all right? <laughs> um, being, being on time is very important to me. I believe it's a character issue. I believe that it's, a, um, it, it's, a, it's an integrity issue. So I, I, I'm really serious about being places on time. But you sit, you get me in a car five minutes late, and I'm like, oh my gosh, what's going on? Well, just people hurry up. <laughs> I was like, you're a pastor. You get frustrated. Yeah, because guess what? I'm a human being just like you are, okay? So relax, okay? <laughs> Earlier in the week, uh, Danielle and I, we were in story time, okay? <laughs> Earlier in the week, Danielle and I were, were on our way somewhere, and, uh, you know, it's kind of a, a busy day for us, and she's, you know, we're off to do something, and she's responding to an email while she's in the passenger side, and um, I'm driving, and, you know, <laughs> it was a good thing she was, because she didn't see what happened. I told her last night, actually, <laughs> it happened earlier in the week, what, what really happened, nothing bad, but, um, you know, a guy just doesn't like his wife to see him mess up while he's driving, okay? <laughs> it just doesn't do very much for our ego, and uh, we just like to make sure it didn't happen and act like it didn't happen. But, but driving down the road, and um, I'm getting ready to take a right onto Ocean Avenue, and, um, you know, there's been some construction on the road, so I'm, um, I was aware of that, and a little bit confusing situation, but... Car was coming. I thought it was going to stop, but I pulled right out in front of the car, you know, and it wasn't, it wasn't that bad, but, man, I cut them right off, and, it, and uh, thank God Danielle was just texting away or actually responding to an email, and, uh, and uh, I thought that they were going to stop because the worker was right there, and I thought everything was going to be fine, but nope, the worker just let them go, and here I am. I, I, I cut them right off, and I, I look in the rearview mirror, I mean, and I, I do one of these, like, you know, hey, sorry, and uh, I gesture to them, and they gestured me back, and they about, about, about three times they told me I was number one, you know? And um, I was not feeling too good about myself, and I look over, and Danielle's still writing her email, like, thank the Lord, you know? <laughs> but um, it was, you know, but, you know, shooting the, the finger, peeling the banana, however, whatever you want to call it, is not the same as shooting somebody with a gun, Certain sins have different consequences, right? You know, you hear it often that all sin is the same. Yes, in the sense that all unforgiven sin will lead us to eternal damnation and hell, but, when our, but, but sin does have different consequences. So, some things have different consequences than others. You see, how we live influences a couple of things. It influences our eternity, our, our consequences here on earth, our rewards in heaven. And for some, the Bible even talks about even the people's, people's punishment in hell. It talks about that in Scripture. You see, shooting the fingers are not the same as shooting a gun. They both influence lives in different ways. See, to, to shoplift a $1 candy bar influences your life a little bit differently than getting drunk and killing somebody from drunk driving. Exaggerating how big your fish was when you got off the boat <laughs> is a little bit different than kidnapping and abusing a child. In Luke 20, 20, 47, it says, The Pharisees devour widows' houses for a show and make lengthy, lengthy prayers. These men will be punished more severely. John 19, 11 says, Therefore the one who handed me over you is guilty of a greater sin, Jesus said to Pilate. See, in some sin in the Bible, it says to, 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 to flee, to, 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 to fight against, to stay away from. But there's one particular sin. It says to run. 1 Corinthians 6, 18 says, run from sexual sin. Don't even try to fight it. Don't even try to, to, to do anything else. It says to, to, to flee, to, to run away from it. Turn your back and go the other way because of its effects on our lives, on our marriages, on our future marriages. For sexual immorality is a sin against your own body. But people say, it doesn't matter what I do unless, you know, unless it affects somebody else. Sin does have consequence. And the Bible says that our body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. It says, he has bought you with a price. Honor God with your body. Second, third cultural belief is since I've already done it, I might as well keep on doing it. <laughs> 
It might be your, your virginity. It might be this a habit that you have. It might be adultery. Maybe cheating on your husband or cheating on your wife, and it just keeps on like, getting easier and easier. It might be pornography. I mean, you look at it once, and it just and it, you keep on going back at, to it, and it just keeps on getting easier and easier and easier and easier every single time. Evidently, Paul had a similar had similar situations back at two thousand years ago in in the church, and he had to deal with it. And he wrote a letter to the Romans talking about this. There was sexual immorality. There was premarital sex going on. There was extramarital sex going on. There was there was um, there was um, all this dishonest things, all these dishonest things going on in that time. But he he, he told them this. They thought because they, the, they experienced the, the grace of God that it gave them a license to sin. Oh, if I sin, God's just going to keep on forgiving me. He's just going to keep on forgiving. God does. If we repent of our sins, he has so much grace and love in him. He forgives us no matter how many times we fall down. He'll pick us up. And there's so much grace and love found in Christ. But then here's what he said. He said, should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace? Of course not. Some scripture says, certainly not. No way. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? See, I love the wonderful work of grace. It, it's life transforming. It, it changes our hearts. It changes our lives. And in fact, it changes our want tos. And I believe that God gives us a desire when grace is imparted to us to want to follow him, to want to please him. But there are times when we make poor decisions. There's times when we, 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 we listen to our flesh and the desires of our, of our heart, the desires of our flesh. And we make choices that, that have consequences on our, on our body, on our relationships with others, and our relationships with God. And every time we make a decision, a wrong decision, it gets easier and easier and easier. We feel less and less convicted. The space between the sin and repentance begins to go like this. See, grace is not an excuse to sin, but it's an empowerment from God it's a love from God. It's an unmerited favor of God that empowers us to live holy lives, gives us power over sin. The Bible says if we love him, we're going to want to keep his commandments. We're going to want to honor him in our, in our body, stay run from, from sexual sin because we know that the, our body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. We're going to want to honor him with our mind and repent of all those negative thoughts and those, those, those mindsets that, that hinder us from, from being renewed through the word of God and even honoring him in our finances and honoring God with our tithes. In our relationships, putting him first, and in, in our in our marriage, and if you're and if you're not married, uh, finding a spouse that loves God more than you. Spiritually, making making a making conscious choice to, to make church a priority, Bible and, and your, by, prayer time and Bible reading. See, this is the thing, and I want you to remember this. I want you to write it down. Spiritual maturity isn't about how much we know; it's really about how much we obey. Anybody getting anything out of this today? Spiritual maturity isn't about how much we know. It's really about how much we obey. In James 1, 21 through 25, in the New Living Translation, it says this. So get rid of all the filth and evil in your lives. Some people say that pastors shouldn't be preaching about sin, that God just takes care of it all for you. But how can we make the adjustments if we don't hear it. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Even the hard things, okay? So get rid of all the filth. And I don't even know why the Bible would even say stuff like this if he didn't want us to hear it. <laughs> so get rid of all the filth and evil in your lives and humbly accept the word of God, the God that God has planted in your hearts. For it has the power to save your souls. Don't just listen to this. Don't just listen to the word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you're only fooling yourselves, for if you listen to the word and don't obey it, it's like glancing at your face in a mirror. You see yourself, you walk away and forget what you look like. But if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, 
And if you do what it says and don't forget what you heard, then God will bless you for doing it. I'm going to have the band come forward, and we're going to wrap this up. Spiritual maturity isn't about how much we know. It's really about how much we obey. It's not about how much we know. It's about how much we obey. See, most Christians are educated well beyond their level of obedience. We know a whole lot of stuff. We, we, we've read scripture. We've heard preaching. We, we, we've lived in, we, we, you know, we grew up in church. We heard all this stuff. And man, we, we watch TV shows. We read this book. We hear this CD. We, we, we listen to this preacher. We go to this special conference. And we've got all this knowledge stored up, which is great. We need to, we need to know about scripture. We need to know about God. But where the rubber hits the, mo- the road is when we do what, the, what God tells us to do. That is the sign of true, true true maturity in Christ. Any amens here today? See, some of the most miserable people in the world, I don't think, are necessarily non-Christians. I think a lot of times it might be Christians who are living in disobedience to God. I think it might be Christians who have experienced the freedom found in Christ, the the liberty, the the grace, the love. But little by little, they've made decisions and they've drifted from him. Little by little, one choice after another, they they don't even realize how they got there. Sin's progressive and no one is exempt from it. We've got to stand on guard. The Bible says, be alert. Be alert. You know, I think of it like an in-ground swimming pool. It's kind of cold in there. You test it. Put your toe in it. Next, you go down the step. It's a little cold. You're trying to get used to it. Another step. You're going a little bit deeper. A little bit deeper. You go into the pool and you keep on walking. Little by little. Getting deeper and deeper until you're well over your head. We dabble a little bit with sin and it just gets grows it becomes greater and greater pornography it grows and grows and grows maybe stealing next time you steal it's easier and easier and easier but I want to tell you the good news today okay <laughs> I want to tell you the good news Sin's a really a real thing. It's just something we all deal with, but God's given us the strength. God's given us the power to overcome sin. He's given us the grace to overcome. And when we are tempted in sin, we have scripture that we can rely on. And 1 Corinthians 10, 3 says, And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. 1 John 1, 8 through 9 says, If we claim that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of all our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. I want us to pray. Today, I believe that God's showing some of us that there's, there's areas in our life that, that, he, he want, that he's bringing to light right now. Man, you didn't mean to get to where you are right now. You didn't mean to, for you to be in the, the situation, the circumstance that you're in. But it was one choice after another, little by little. And you found out that sin will, go, will take you further than you want to go. It'll cost you more than what you want to pay. 
And it's affected your marriage, it's affected your job, it's affected your relationship with God. Right now you, you feel like, the, like because of it, you, you've grown callous and, you, and, you, and you're having a hard time hearing Him. But today what I want you to do is I want you to, I want you to go before God, I want you to say, God... This thing that you bring to my attention right now, I repent. I, Lord, I, I turn from it, and I want to live for you. Lord, I don't want to live like this. Lord, I want to honor you with my whole life. And today, Lord, I commit my life to you again. I commit my life to holiness. I, I commit my life to the purity, Lord. I commit myself to mature in you. Lord, if it means I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to open up my Bible every day, make that commitment, I'm going to do it. If, it. if it means, Lord, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray in the morning before my day starts, I'm going to do it. And today, the, the Lord's speaking to you, and he wants you to commit and growing in him. He wants you to commit to taking the steps to follow him with your whole heart. And today, if the Lord's speaking to you, and you want prayer today, if the Lord is, is speaking to you, say, God, I will obey you. Lord, I will follow you no matter what. And if that's you, I want you to raise your hand. Yes, 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 yes. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Because spiritual maturity isn't about how much we know. It's really about how much we obey. Father, you see the hands raised around here today. I thank you that you have so much grace. You have so much love for us, Lord. And Lord, that help is available, Lord. The power is available, Lord, for, to, for us to have victory. Lord, you said in your word that we are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ. You said that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Today, we draw our strength from you. Lord, in the good times, in the hard times, or in the, the difficult times, when, when sin is surrounding us, when, when temptation lies right in front of us, Lord, we thank you that you give us the strength, that you're faithful. And today, Lord, we honor you. Maybe here today you've never given your life to Christ. Maybe today that you've never decided to follow him before. Man, you've, you've been to church. And maybe right now the, the way that you can describe yourselves, you feel far from God. And I want to tell you this. When Jesus died on the cross, he was thinking of you. When Jesus came to earth, he came for you. He lived a sinless and perfect life and became the perfect sacrifice for you. All your sin, all your shame was cast upon him. Because somebody had to pay for your sin, he paid a price that you couldn't pay for. He, he paid a debt that he didn't even owe. And today you want to make a commitment to follow him. To Jesus, forgive me my sin. Make me new. I want to follow you. Come into my life. Amen.